Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor join us today. I'm Chris Beecham with Gold Derby. They've got two movies out this year that they've composed the score on, Soul for Disney Pixar and Mank for Netflix. Guys, as we start out, I wanted to ask you, what is the difference, now that you've worked with both of them, between Pete Docter and David Fincher? <sighs> <laughs> they don't seem like they would be. They, they don't seem like they would be. Well, all <clears throat> Pete is quite a bit taller. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what other differences are there? Well, I mean, uh, you know, unquestionably, they're both artists. Um, you know, in terms of trying to think of a clever answer, which I don't have. Um, yeah, I don't have a clever answer for, <laughs> between them. What about you, Trina? Um, I'll, I'll start with how they're similar. They're similar in the sense that they both are very impressively meticulous, um, able to have a great macro picture of everything that's happening and also able to get incredibly down into the details and weeds with an astounding amount of attention to detail and somehow maintaining a sense of objectivity in our experience with both of them. Um, in terms of, you know, we know David Fincher a lot better as we've worked with him a lot longer and have a much longer term friendship. The processes are very different between Pixar and the way that Fincher works um, in a way that when you ask that question, it was puzzling to even think about because they feel like radically different um, ways of working. Um, with Pixar, we were quite impressed and, and, and um, flattered by the inclusion, you know, the, the process, the Pixar process that we witnessed is one where it's very collaborative in terms of almost everybody up at Pixar is their, their opinions are being valued and considered and very regularly everything from the script to the way things look is run by, you know, a, a, a large group of people. And it's an interesting um, culture up there, you know, with Fincher, <clears throat> You know, it's us and him and his core team of people that we've worked with quite a lot. Um, Kirk Baxter editing, Ren Clay sound designer, for example. And that's also a very collaborative uh, situation to be in, a very respectful situation, but it, it feels more uh, contained. You know, it, it feels more intimate in, in a lot of ways. Atticus, when you sign on to do a movie, and of course you've done quite a few David Fincher movies now, let's start with Mank and let's start with Fincher. What, what's the very first step when, when you're coming on board a project? Well, the very first step uh, is we're sent the script. And in the case of Mank, it's a, it was a fairly dense script. And I remember reading it then I remember doing a lot of Googling to understand, you know, the, the people, uh, um, you know, the basically life in Hollywood in, uh, you know, the late thirties going into 1940, um, read it a couple more times and then we had a breakfast. Um, and that's usually, the kind of beginnings of a project. And in that meeting at breakfast, we discuss, you know, the notion of the film, but Fincher himself is very kind of, like he's very generous and he's not, he, he's, he's an empowerer. So it's kind of like the, concept of how to approach a music I remember being um, he said well maybe it's solo piano maybe it's orchestra uh, somewhat inspired by Bernard Herrmann maybe it's 
going against it in all synthesizers. So it's this kind of, there's an openness and usually we leave those meetings not with any firm decision and it's left up to us and we go back and spend, you know, a couple of days kind of digesting the information that we've got and what would be the best approach. Trent, I love this period. Uh, I have, you know, from the films of that period and also when movies go back to that period, late 30s, early 40s, how did that period influence the choices you made on putting the score together? Well, like Atticus was saying, um, <clears throat> the primary directive, like w when we start a project, just to back up one second, I look at the creative process as two branches. One is a more editorial, thoughtful, cerebral planning type phase. And the other side of it, which can happen concurrently, is the tuning out emotional gut instinct like where I think the main creativity comes from. So in the case of Mank, for example, you know, typically when we start a project with Mank, for example, we listen for clues as to what kind of story David's trying to tell, but at the same time being mindful of our own reaction to our first exposure to it. Cause we, we get, we miss out on the final experience that everyone else gets, you know, because we're making the sausage and I think it's important to kind of keep tabs on where your emotional um, reaction or gut instinct leads you. So to, to make that make more sense, when the clues given, the breadcrumbs given by Fincher initially were, to me, the most important one was, I'd like this film to feel like we found it in the archives. It hasn't been touched since 1940. It's been on the shelf somewhere collecting dust. I'm going to shoot it in four by three, I'm gonna have, or he ended up not doing it. It's gonna shoot in black and white. We're gonna mix it in mono. Uh, we want it to feel like it's an artifact. And I said, are you gonna shoot on film? Oh, no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> okay, so we've got a little breathing room, but the impression was one that we wanted to seem like that. So uh, we then, as Attica said, had the ability to kind of take it wherever we wanted, but felt after a, a, a short amount of experimentation that the, the palette of an orchestra, the palette of something that felt inspired by Bernard Herrmann, what he might do of, in that time period, seemed like an interesting challenge. And then the reason I mentioned that other branch of creativity is it would be easy, I think, for it to become gimmicky and corny by okay, here, here's the stunt for this score. We're gonna just do this, do it this way. We're gonna make it sound old timey. We're gonna um, only use these instruments. And really try, once we kind of figured out, we think that's the canvas we wanna paint on, then it, then it was surprisingly um, natural to kick into that other world of just gut composing using that palette as, as, as the paints. And uh, it was, we learned a lot and it was fun and it was interesting and it, it, it became the kind of set of containing parameters for us to, to work with it. Well, I'm glad you mo both mentioned Bernard Herrmann. I, I felt that influence a little bit here. And I wanted to ask you today, I've, I've seen both of you and, and either in print or on video talk about rock influences in your lives, especially with Nine Inch Nails, but I haven't really heard you talk about and I'm not talking about just Mank here, but just influences you've had from other composers, other film composers over your life, scores you've loved or film composers you've loved. I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I think it's probably important, I'll start to say that, you know, neither of us come from a formal background and training in film composition. So a lot of, we're not saying that as a badge of honor, it's just, as we were asked 10 or so years ago with Fincher to do social network with the kind of time frame of, can you do it in the next few months? You know, we were faced with, well, how do you score a film? You know, and what served us well in that situation was kind of transferring what we did know how to do, say, arrange songs, and emotionally know how to arrange music in a rock song format over to 
stripping it of the structure, but applying some of the same techniques and kind of emotional mining that we would do to, to, to support the lyrics of what we're trying to go for with the song against um, dialogue and script in, in a different kind of package. Um, so we've modified that process, but it's been essentially the same since then of kind of turning inward, going with gut reaction um, to try to find things that are appropriate for each project we work on. In terms of what's influenced me, I mean, Atticus and I, I think would both say that uh, Taxi Driver, from score for that, feels inseparable from the picture, that it would be a different movie without that music playing in there. And what we will consciously do at the beginning of a project is, it is aspire to create something as unique, but yet appropriate for whatever project it is, is what that was able to attain. Something that isn't cookie cutter, could be any score, kind of just serving a mechanical function, but something that elevates the story or elevates the presentation into something that has its own uniqueness to it. I mean, aside from that, I find the sound design of David Lynch and what he, how he uses sound and music in his pictures is something that's been hugely inspiring, not just to our scoring work, but Nine Inch Nails. I find uh, John Carpenter's scores back in the, in the heydays of the 80s, late, late 70s uh, or 80s, did something that really resonated with me in, in a lot of ways. Um, at you want to add anything to that? Well, I was just going to pick up on the idea of the inseparable and the aspiration. Um, and that ties into our process. And it's one of the reasons why we start so early. Um, you know, in the case of Mank, um, we were writing as they were shooting. In the case of uh, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, we'd already done a couple of hours of music based off the script. And the idea, the idea is not to kind of pre-score, it's to find that voice, like what, what could be the unique uh, way to tell this story that sits in service to the picture and the story and the emotional content, but really is part of the DNA of the creation. So <clears throat> um, we've mentioned before, it's not the best business model because obviously we spend a lot longer on, um, on each film. And in this case, um, in the case of Mank, that uh, the point that Trent was talking of, you know, for me, I was actually pretty nervous about uh, jumping into this world. But when we did start, it, it sounds trite to say it, but it was a lot of, we had a lot of fun. And that initial composition, again, was trying to find the voice and it sort of separated somewhat just organically between big band and, um, you know, and the orchestral and some solo piano, um, which we sent to Fincher and kind of got a, got the best response you can get all in capitals. Um, in terms of like, you know, Mank say specifically, we had, Fincher gave us a playlist and there was a lot of exploration in terms of music of the era, just constantly playing, or, you know, living in that for a while. But in terms of um, my, I, I don't listen to, I don't listen to scores in the car very often. Like I think the last score that I would listen to as an album when I'm driving around with Mika Levy's Under the Skin. Um, you know, I'm aware and, I, and I'm, you know, often in awe of other composers, but I, I've, I sort of feel like, you know, I, I, I feel like we have our little world and there's certainly a lot of investigation that goes into each project, but I'm not consciously referencing other composers unless it's required. And in this case, it what there was a specific 
um, you know, Kane being Herman's first film score. And Trent on Soul, uh, an animated feature, uh, you mentioned Pixar and the relationship working with them. Is there any difference in, in the way you started out in your process for working on animation as opposed to a, a, um, a, a feature theatrical? The, the process ended up being quite a bit different, but the, the relationship was different because it was a new entity, you know, and I mean, being totally frank, when we first were brought on board, it was, I, I remember roughly hearing, well, we'd like to have some music by, you know, the end of next year. It was that long ahead of time, um, which gave us plenty of time to be anxious about it, plenty of sleepless nights. <laughs> uh, and I think the honest part being, um, we were a little intimidated and, and we sensed whether it was real or not, we felt like we needed to kind of show them, hey, we can, we can, we can do this. We can do something that's outside our wheelhouse. It's appropriate for this film. And I'd say the first huge chunk of time was really kind of noodling around in uh, concepts of positivity and pleasantness and, and giving a kind of demo reel of here, here's some things we can do that kind of feel optimistic and feel less less threatening, let's say, of which almost none of it ended up being in the movie, which was a long ways away from even being realized at that point, where it felt a lot different. And I think in hindsight, we started a bit too early was, you know, there was no soul, there was no script for soul. It was all animatics. So they'd send you, here's a 90 minute version of the film with couple frames a second hand-drawn uh, animation with a temp voiceovers. And it, it was surprisingly, it was a surprisingly articulate way to experience the film. It felt after the first 30 seconds, you were used to that and you could really get the story and get the pacing and the feel of it. But what I think with the main difference was as we started scoring to picture, you know, because it was malleable, it wasn't actors and shot film you'd find that you know hey there's a new cut that showed up reels download the reels and a certain character's not in the film anymore there's a whole new act where there's a chase scene that never existed before the ending's totally different there's a new uh character that wasn't there before <laughs> you know, it's like, okay so all that stuff we did is irrelevant because it doesn't exist it was a different film and we went through that quite a number of times you know and, they, and part of their process is a constant revision and tightening and um, improvement of well, everything not not just a few frames moving but whole sequences disappearing and orders of events changing and endings being different up until when it's time to pull the trigger to start rendering and animate properly when the real money gets deployed um, so it was a lot, it was a lot of uh, pieces in motion more than we're accustomed to at a much later time. And I think he mentioned at one point, Pete, you know, normally we don't get a composer involved until all this is done, you know? And that was an example of us thinking, I could see the benefit of that from the composition side because we, you know, we, we there was a lot of work that will never be, you know, seen in that. So it was part of our process of winding up where we did which we're happy with, so. I think that's why I struggled with your first question is, is the, the uh, process between animation and live action or Pixar's version of it is just so different. Um, you know, once you under, understand a script, you kind of understand, you know, kind of parameters of what you're working with. But with, with Pixar, that is the script. So the script is constantly changing and evolving as you're working. And it, it just, you know, it just, it puts you in a kind of different mind space, I suppose. And, and, it, and like, like Trent mentioned, it does radically kind of affect uh, you know, the process of, uh, you know, 
how, how one's interacting with the film. Well, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask you about one other thing. Um, you had such a good year in terms of uh, creatively and career-wise with these two films coming out at the end of the year, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, the Emmy win for Watchmen back in September. Uh, so congratulations on all of, all of that, even though we've all had Thank a rough, rough year personally. Um, I guess I wanted to ask in terms of the Emmy win, that means you've got the, uh, the Oscar, the Grammy, and the Emmy. Um, only 16 people have gotten all four with the Tony included. Is there anything you've thought about that would take the two of you to Broadway and, and, and go after that Tony award? <laughs> No, we're, we're, we're always up for a challenge. You know, it's, it's like when you, when I heard you say that, that list of accomplishments this year set against, or this past year set against the backdrop of the kind of brutality and the relentlessness of this pandemic and politically what's happening. Um, and as parents trying to keep our kids safe and sane and happy and some sense of normality, um, it has been a weird juxtaposition of, accolades <laughs> set against this year that I think we all would like to put in, put in the rear view mirror. Um, and the, the reason, I guess the summary of what I'm trying to get at is we're just grateful that we've had the opportunity to work with really great people. You know, going back to your first question, you know, the similarities of uh, Pete and David are that they're, they're both geniuses you know uh, di different styles of genius but they're both the very best at what they do and being around it is kind of what gives us we thrive on that you know we're searching out excellence because we are inspired by it you know and having and i think what scoring is filling up for us we're not looking at it as trying to conquer the world and and get every film or prove we can do every type of genre it's really just as, as we've had a minute to kind of reflect on things in the last few years, it's, it, it's searching out that opportunity to be in contained forced collaborative situations with different camps of people. And that feeling of doing the best you could doing your part on this project around people that are inspiring and you come out the other end and you're, you're changed. And, and usually for the better, you've had an experience that you wouldn't have had had we just been in a rock band, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But we come out usually exhausted and inspired and ready to try something different. You know, If there was something in the musical world that came up that we thought we could do, we'd go all, all for it. But it's not the directive to try to tick the box so much. You know. Well, I loved the, um, the film that they put together on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame about, about the band and your careers. Uh, that, I thought that was that was quite well edited and put together, and I so oh, wish was, we could have seen you perform in person. Yeah, we wanted to. That was Morgan Neville that did that, and I thought he did a great job on that. It was uh, it was. I'm super uncomfortable watching stuff like that, you know. And I hadn't seen how it turned out, and I watched it with my family, and I was sweaty, and you know, <laughs> I hadn't I didn't see what Iggy Pop had said. I knew he was going to say something, and it just makes me feel kind of. I'm proud, but it's I'm not one that to enjoy the spotlight. And I know Atticus is the same way. Right, right. Well, I'm hoping, you know, when they do another Hall of Fame ceremony, and it can be live, hopefully later this year, around October, November, the three bands that are, are still active and, and working, uh, Nine Inch Nails and Depeche Mode and um, Doobie Brothers, I hope they'll figure out a way, they'll have a new induction class you know, late, late this year, but I hope they'll figure out a way to have all of you on there and perform as you should have gotten a chance to do this last time. That would be so much Me fun. Me too. I appreciate that. I, I agree with you. Well, good luck with award season. Uh, you'd be one of the rare composers to get in for uh, two films, but I think it certainly could happen with Soul and Mank, and, and we wish you all the best. That's very kind of you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.